Hello everyone, my name is Tyler Sullivan and I'm a fourth year medical student at Toro University, California. Welcome back to our four part video lecture series on stroke syndromes. In the first three videos, we covered blood supply to the brain and anterior circulation strokes. And now we're on to part four, which is our final video. And in it, we'll be covering posterior circulation strokes. So part four, posterior circulation strokes. Posterior circulation is supplied via the vertebral arteries. As described earlier, the vertebral arteries arise from the subclavian arteries and ascend through the transverse foramina of cervical vertebrae C6 to C1, and then enter the foramen magnum. The vertebral arteries shown here will give off the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, or pica, before converging to form the basilar artery on the ventral surface of the brainstem at the level of the pons. The basilar artery will give off the anterior inferior cerebellar artery or ICA and the superior cerebellar artery before bifurcating at the base of the brain to form the right and left posterior cerebral arteries. The posterior cerebral arteries will complete the circle of Willis by joining the anterior circulation via the posterior communicating arteries Note that the vertebral and basilar arteries and their branches make up the vertebral basilar system. And we're gonna start by covering three common brainstem syndromes of the vertebral basilar system. Wallenberg syndrome is also known as lateral medullary syndrome or pica syndrome. It is the most typical posterior circulation ischemic stroke syndrome in clinical practice. It is caused by occlusion of the vertebral artery or posterior inferior cerebellar artery. The bottom right illustration is a mid-medulla brainstem slice showing the structures supplied by the pica. For the three brainstem syndrome in, syndromes in this lecture, I'm going to list the deficits and corresponding damaged structures in a table format like so. So let's get started. A lesion to the anterolateral system, which contains spinothalamic fibers, gives us contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation to the body. Next, damage to the cranial nerve 5 spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract gives us ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation to the face. A common theme that we'll see with brainstem syndromes is deficits to the body and face being on opposite sides. Recall the body and facial deficits associated with MCA stroke were both localized to the same side. Opposite sides should clue you in on the brainstem. So moving on, damage to the cranial nerve eight vestibular nuclei gives us vertigo, nystagmus, and nausea vomiting. A lesion to the solitary nucleus and tract, which contains fibers of cranial nerves seven and nine yields loss of taste to the half of the tongue ipsilateral to the lesion. Damage to the nucleus ambiguous containing fibers of cranial nerves nine and 10 gives us hoarseness, dysphagia, decreased gag reflex and uvular deviation. Lesion to the rest of form body results in ataxia. And lastly, damage to the sympathetic tracts may result in ipsilateral Horner syndrome, which consists of ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and enophthalmos. The next brainstem syndrome is lateral pontine syndrome, which is a result of an anterior inferior cerebellar artery occlusion. The bottom right illustration is a caudal pons brainstem slice. In blue, we see the structures supplied by ICA. Being just a few levels up from the medulla slice we saw in Wallenberg syndrome, there are a few of the same structures affected in lateral pontine syndrome, such as the anterolateral system, which gives us contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation to the body. The cranial nerve five spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract giving us ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation to the face. The cranial nerve eight vestibular nuclei giving us vertigo, 
nystagmus, nausea and vomiting, and the sympathetic tracts resulting in ipsilateral Horner syndrome. New structures affected in this syndrome are bolded on the table. The first is the facial motor nucleus, which contains lower motor neurons of the facial nerve or cranial nerve seven. A lesion here leads to ipsilateral facial paralysis of both upper and lower halves of the face since the lower motor neurons are affected. We also see decreased lacrimation, decreased salivation, and decreased taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue on the ipsilateral side. Damage to the cochlear nucleus, which is the other half of cranial nerve eight, yields ipsilateral sensory neural hearing loss. And lastly, the middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles are affected, which results in ipsilateral ataxia and dysmetria. The third brainstem syndrome is ventral pontine syndrome, otherwise known as locked-in syndrome, which is a result of basilar artery occlusion. Since the basilar artery is the predominant artery supplying the ventral pons, strokes in this location have a relatively poor functional outcome. Damage to bilateral corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts result in quadriplegia and loss of all voluntary facial, mouth, and tongue movements. Ocular cranial nerve nuclei and the paramedian pontine reticular formation leads to loss of horizontal but not vertical eye movements. If the reticular activating system is spared, consciousness is preserved in these patients. The only voluntary motor function left for these people are vertical eye movements and the ability to blink. So case number three, an 80 year old man presents with acute vision loss. He reports difficulty seeing objects on his right side. His wife said he also reports seeing people who are not in the room. On exam, there are no motor or sensory deficits. We have his visual fields shown on the bottom left here, where the dark gray means no vision, and his MRI is also shown here. So which artery is involved? Posterior cerebral artery is the correct answer. And this is also part of the posterior circulation. The posterior cerebral artery is shown here in purple and it supplies the medial and inferior temporal lobe as well as the occipital lobe. In this diagram on the left, we could see the posterior cerebral artery and its branches coursing back to supply the inferior temporal lobe as well as the occipital lobe. We can see the same thing over here, the posterior cerebral artery being the inferior temporal lobe and the occipital lobe. So for a posterior cerebral artery stroke, these symptoms are relatively unique. The PCA supplies the primary visual cortex. So damage to this area results in contralateral homonymous hemianopia, similar to those to that of MCA strokes. Except in PCA strokes, the macula or the center of the visual field is spared due to collateral circulation to the occipital pole from the MCA. This illustration shows us the difference between a left PCA stroke with macular sparing and a left MCA stroke with the macula being affected. In some instances, the patient may experience visual hallucinations in the blind parts of the visual field as seen in the case that we just went over. Infarcts in the dominant hemisphere may cause a variety of visual agnosias, such as the inability to recognize objects, but still able to draw them as seen in this illustration here. The patient can see the object, perceive the object, copy a drawing of the object, describe the object's function, and can even use the object correctly. 
but they can't recognize what it is. They may also be unable to recognize human faces. They know that they are looking at faces, but they can't recognize people by the side of their face, even people they know well. Infarcts of the dominant occipital region and the splenium of the corpus callosum produces alexia without agraphia. In this syndrome, patients can write, but they cannot read what they have written or what anyone else has written. Additionally, non-dominant PCA territory infarctions may cause contralateral visual field neglect. Many more similar deficits have been described in the literature, and these are some of the main ones. Of note, PCA strokes typically do not yield any motor or sensory deficits, which helps us distinguish this from the other major artery and brainstem syndromes. So a quick note about the NIH stroke scale. The stroke scale is one of the most commonly used measures of both initial stroke severity and response to treatment, particularly in the acute setting. Increasing scores indicate a more severe stroke and have been shown to correlate with the size of infarction on both CT and MRI evaluation. And when assessed within the first 48 hours following a stroke, scores have been shown to correlate with clinical outcomes at the three month and one year mark. Today, payers and regulators demand reportable data on patient outcomes, and such outcomes must be adjusted for baseline severity. The NIH stroke scale has become the metric for regulatory compliance. And while the scale has utility, it is important to keep in mind that it was designed for research purposes, not to serve as a bedside rating tool for the widespread use outside of these trials. The investigators who created the NIH stroke scale for their large scale clinical trials tailored it to assure that when users of differing skill levels used it, the results were reproducible. The ability to accurately capture each individual's unique deficits was a secondary goal. The NIH stroke scale in current use has evolved from an earlier version that is no longer used, but the scale still does not accurately reflect a patient's coordination, gait impairment, cortical sensory function, distal motor function, memory, or cognition. Don't get me wrong, it has its benefits, but it's important to appreciate that it also has limitations and it should be used with caution and not as a substitute for a comprehensive neurological examination. If you take away one thing from this presentation, let it be this, the NIH stroke scale favors anterior circulation and left-sided strokes and de-emphasizes posterior circulation and right-sided strokes. Just because it's a zero, one, or two on the stroke scale, that doesn't mean that there's no stroke and the patient may still have a deficit that can have significant impact on functional outcome. Lastly, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Manoj Middle, who inspired me to create this presentation and served as my attending through two neurocritical care rotations during my clinical years. I learned so much from him and I can't thank him enough. Here are my references for parts one through four. And that concludes the final video in our four part video lecture series on stroke syndromes. Thank you all for watching and I hope this was helpful.